Welcome, everybody. We're so excited to have you here with us today. I'm Kelly McCoy. I am the Director of Strategic Programs and Protocol for the College of Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. This is our first in a series of programs we're going to be doing for high school students around career exploration opportunities in the engineering fields. Today, we're going to be discussing biomedical engineering, and we have some um, faculty uh, alum and some students here with us who are going to share some of the exciting things that they're doing. Um, before I turn it over to Professor Cook, I want to let you all know that you will be able to submit questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens. At the end of the program, Dr. Cook will post those questions to the panelists and um, we will get through as many questions as we can in the time that we have allotted. In the meantime, please sit back and learn something about biomedical engineering. I think you'll find it to be a very exciting field. And now I'd like to introduce interim head of the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon, Dr. Keith Cook. Keith? Thanks a lot, Kelly. Um, and thank you all for attending. It's exciting that you're all here with us today. So I'm gonna start off our discussion today by talking about what is biomedical engineering. To start this off by describing what biomedical engineers do. So biomedical engineers use science, math, and design to solve medical problems. And there's a variety of medical problems that biomedical engineers will, will attempt to solve but I'm gonna start on one that's, that's very timely, and that's the problem of SARS-CoV-2 infection that leads to COVID-19 disease. So a biomedical engineering, engineer might be thinking about COVID-19 and contemplating how they can, can create some solution to this problem that our society is facing. And so they're gonna to turn to their their background, their education in science, math, and design, and start to innovate some new solution. And this really could be any type of solution, and I'll talk about a few here today. And it really depends on the biomedical engineer's interests and background. So I wanna, I wanna emphasize that the way biomedical engineers think, how they approach this problem of COVID-19 is different than the way doctors approach this problem. And so I wanna talk about how, how doctors and biomedical engineers think. So a doctor in addressing the COVID-19 problem would think, given the tools at my disposal, so I've got these drugs that I can use to treat the disease state, these medical instruments, I have these diagnostic tests that I can help, that can help me understand the disease. So how do I use those to help the patient? Now, the way a biomedical engineer thinks is very different. The biomedical engineer thinks, given my skill set, everything that I know, everything that I can do, how do I create a new technology that will ultimately help these same patients. Now I wanna emphasize that biomedical engineers are not all the same. We're all very different. Um, as you can see here, I'm showing you a bunch of biomedical engineers and they're all thinking about COVID-19, but the way that they think about it is gonna be different. I think that, that all biomedical engineers are interested in helping others. All of us love solving problems. But we might go about that a little bit differently. Each one of us has different likes and dislikes in school. And this led us to study different things in college, in graduate school. And so what we did is we, we all developed different skill sets. And so how we approach this problem is going to be different. So I'm going to, I'm going to start with one example, biomedical biomed engineer. We will call him Steve. Let's call him Steve. So Steve's thinking about COVID-19. 
And Steve really loves math and coding. And so the way he thinks about that is going to be a little bit different. So Steve is watching the news and he sees this story about how social distancing is really important. If you can stay apart from each other, it can slow the spread of COVID-19. So Steve is really curious about this and what he wants to do is provide the best guidance to people that he possibly can. And so with his background, Steve generates a mathematical model of the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 virus in the air. So he creates this mathematical model to understand how does standing far apart from each other affect the disease transmission? What is the effect of wearing a mask? Is it different if you're inside or outside? As you can see, he's modeling here a gentle breeze. Now, here's another example of a biomedical engineer, and let's call her Emily. So Emily is interested in different things. Emily is a tinkerer. She really likes devices, gadgets. She likes working with her hands. And she's very mechanically inclined. So Emily is addressing the same problem, COVID-19. But what interests her is the fact that she sees that a lot of patients with COVID-19 have severe respiratory failure. In order to keep these patients alive, these patients are placed on a mechanical ventilator. And this mechanical ventilator is required to provide the necessary oxygen and remove carbon dioxide to keep the patient alive. And what she reads is that there are so many patients on mechanical ventilators that it is really straining our healthcare system that doctors are having trouble caring for all of these patients. She likes devices. And so what she does, she innovates a mechanical ventilator that can be connected to the internet and that doctors can then control that mechanical ventilator remotely via a computer or a smartphone. And so one doctor can control potentially hundreds of mechanical ventilators at the same time, making the burden of healthcare less on that doctor. So the, the last example of a biomedical engineer I'm gonna show is, is this, this uh, engineer here, let's call her Lucy. Um, Lucy doesn't love math. Um, she's pretty good at it, but, but she does not love it. What she really loves is biology. Now, she still, really loves problem solving. And so she thinks, I still wanna be a biomedical engineer, um, but maybe I'll orient my, my education a little bit differently. So Lucy sees on the news that people who are overweight tend to get a more severe case of COVID-19 and they get sicker. She's really interested in this. And so what Lucy does is Lucy creates these biomedically engineered tissues that create significant amounts of fat. And she uses these tissues to study how the SARS-CoV-2 virus can enter tissues and thrive um, when there is a lot of fat present. There's not a lot of math in her work, but she is still a biomedical engineer. So hopefully what I've shown you is a, is a variety of different ways that biomedical engineers can impact a single health problem that we're facing as a society. And, and hopefully I've shown you that, that they all have very different interests um, but they all love problem solving and they all love helping people. So we are going to meet uh, several more biomedical engineers here today, and they are shown here, but I will allow them each to introduce themselves.
Erica, why don't you start? Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Erica. Um, I am a fourth year PhD student here at CMU. To give you a little bit about my background, I am from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I went to University of Delaware for undergrad, and I specifically studied biomedical engineering. I actually started out as a math major and then transferred to BME um, once I kind of realized how much like interaction you get with doctors and patients that very much drew me to the major. Just to go a little bit into the detail of uh, what an honors program is, I know you guys are probably thinking about college way in the future, maybe you're not, that's also okay. Um, but University of Delaware, uh, it's a state school and it has an honors program, which is something you can do where it's like a smaller group of students and it'll give you some smaller class sizes. So that's kind of how you, you can the feel of a school like CMU where there's smaller numbers, but at a larger institution with a lot of uh, while I was in undergrad, I got devices. So those are things like walkers, as making all of those tools. And then when I started my PhD right out of undergrad, I started studying artificial lungs, um, but also tissue engineering. So using cells and materials found in the body to make tissues that have functional capacity. Thank you, Eric. Rachel, can you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Rachel. Um, I am a fourth year PhD student in the biomedical engineering program here at CMU. Um, give you a little bit of background. I went to high school in Tallahassee, Florida, and then I went to do my undergrad at the University of Rochester in uh, upstate New York, uh, which was also a private small um, institution similar to CMU. Um, and then I did my master's at Minnesota, University of Minnesota, uh, with my current advisor, and we moved to um, Carnegie Mellon kind of during my uh, master's and PhD process. Um, our lab works on brain-computer interfaces, so um, the video that you just saw with the robotic arm, uh, we've also used um, bring computer interfaces to control helicopters, uh, quadcopters, um, et cetera. Um, and what I'm actually more specifically interested in is neuromodulation. And that's um, the way to use medical devices to interface with the brain and treat the disease models. Chelsea, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Chelsea Marsh. Um, I work at Bayer. I'm the chief engineer of the Cellent product family line. Um, Stellan is an injector that pushes contrast into patients' bodies during an injection, um, and I'll go over it later when we talk about um, how you can be a bioengineer at Bayer. Um, a little bit of background about me. So I'm from Pittsburgh. Um, I'm from the South Hills, specifically Mount Lebanon, if there's any Lebo kids in the house. Um, and I actually got interested in bioengineering because I'm from Pittsburgh. Uh, in the news, there were always reports of ACL injuries in Steelers. Um, and I was a ballet dancer, so a lot of my friends were getting hurt, and I obviously I got hurt too. Um, and so I got very interested in orthopedics um, and understanding how you could help someone who had an injury like that. So I went to Carnegie Mellon for my undergrad. Um, I, did, I double majored in chemical and biomedical engineering um, just because I really liked chemistry. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about how I got to my master's, but I got my master's at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia in bioengineering. And I couldn't get enough of school, so I came back to Pitt and I got my PhD at the University of Pittsburgh where I studied orthopedic biomechanics. Um, and then I took a complete shift and now I work in medical devices at Bayer. Um, I work at the Bayer location that's north of the city um, in Indianola, real near Harmerville. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about Bayer in a bit, but it's nice to meet everybody. Thank you, Conrad. Good afternoon, folks. I'm Conrad Zapanta. I'm the Associate Department Head of Education at, at Biomedical Engineering here at Carnegie Mellon. Quickly about myself, I did my undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon as well um, in biomedical and mechanical engineering, PhD at, the, uh, at Penn State and doing artificial heart and heart valve research. I actually was in industry for a while doing artificial hearts and heart valves. I'm actually doing testing and um, also doing testing both in the lab and in animals as well. 
Um, had a research program for a while at Penn State Hershey. Yes, as in the chocolate. Um, testing artificial hearts for smaller adults and for children. And then back here at Carnegie Mellon uh, for the last 16 years uh, teaching. And I actually had the pleasure of teaching uh, Dr. Marsh when she was a student at Carnegie Mellon. Thanks, Conrad. So now we will turn it over to uh, Erica Comer, who will tell you about her research. All right, I think we should be good to go here. So my research deals with bioengineered organs. So what are bioengineered organs? They're devices or biologics that will either supplement or add to, or in often cases, replace the native function of organs in the body that are failing or just need some help. For example, with COVID, a lot of people's lungs have really needed some help lately. Um, but outside of the pandemic, there's always people with things like lung disease or kidney failure that could use assistance. Our purpose is to offer alternatives to organ transplantation because there simply are not enough donors. These devices or biologics can be made with synthetic materials and you can think of plastic as a key one here, or they can also um, be in combination with natural materials such as collagen, which is the most abundant protein in the body. Your body will typically respond to foreign materials um, and it will launch this huge immune response, just similar to the immune response you get when you have a cold. Often it will trigger blood clotting as well. So ideally we want these bio organs to consist entirely of natural materials that the body will accept and have a minimal reaction to. To give you an example of a bioengineered organ. Um, artificial lungs is one that has been particularly useful recently. The way this works is it uses an oxygenation device that is positioned outside of the body. There are three examples here of what those devices can look like. Blood is drawn out through a essentially a tube that acts just like a straw would, where it's sutured into one of your blood vessels. The blood is pulled from the body passes through the skin, enters the gas exchange device, and then within that device, gas is passively uh, exchanged where your blood then has a higher oxygen content and a lower carbon dioxide content. And then the blood is sent back into the body and returned to the circulatory system. This is very effective, but the key problem here is that just like I mentioned before, the plastic will actually cause the blood to clot. So my PhD is focused on replacing those plastic membranes or the plastic interface with ones that are made with natural materials and cells. Fundamentally, what does this look like? Well, if you're looking at your native alveolar capillary barrier, so that's where you have these air sacs in your lungs. You can see that they look like bundles of grapes down here. Yeah, so there's capillaries or very small blood vessels that surround all of these air sacs. And at a fundamental level, this means that you have a layer of uh, epithelial cells, the cells that are in your alveoli, your lungs, and then the biomaterial layer, which is mostly collagen, and then a layer of endothelial cells, which are the cell types that line all of your blood vessels and control clotting. So if we're gonna create a gas exchange interface that better matches what's in the body to leverage those mechanisms, we want to create a model on the bench top that has similar cell types and that is very thin so that we can try to get gas exchange across it. So these are some images generated from my research, which is to recreate this 2D gas exchange interface. You can see how we have a layer of lung epithelial cells on the top there. That's the thicker bright colors. And then we have a biomaterial region and then endothelial cells on the bottom. And so our end goal is really to have a full-size device that works just like this plastic oxygenator um, so that we can conduct gas exchange to support patients. One more example of a important part of tissue engineering for bioengineered organs 
is creating the scaffold material. So if we're working with proteins, this is a little bit different than how you would work with something like plastic. Most of you may have seen or even used a plastic 3D printer before. This is the concept where you have a hot nozzle that is extruding plastic filament. And if you draw a square over and over again, you're gonna end up with a rectangular cylinder or a rectangular prism. But if you're printing with a liquid solution, like with proteins, then one thing we can do is use a support bath that holds the fluid in place during printing. You can think about this as the same system where if you have a bottle of hair gel, oftentimes you see little air bubbles in it. That's a great example of a fluid being held by another fluid. With bioprinting though, that external support can then be melted away and then release the internal structure so that we end up with collagen one protein scaffolds that have useful biomedical applications. Collagen one, for example, can be printed using uh, MRI files. I think we'll, we might talk a little bit about that later today. So this is something that has the structure of the native organ built out of materials found in the body and is now ready to be cellularized or have cells adhered to the structure. We've also fabricated things like heart valves and we've completed functional testing that show that these structures that we can create really are approaching um, the capacity that we need to use them in the body soon. We can take more questions in the chat too. Thank you, Erica. Rachel? Okay. Let me pull up my slides. Okay, I hope you guys can see this. So my lab's research is on brain-computer interfaces. So um, what, what that means is we have to first understand the brain um, trying to figure out what the brain wants, then we uh, use those signals to control a device. Uh, for example, that could be in a robotic arm or um, a wheelchair or a drone or anything uh, that the patient would need. Um, and then we would provide a feedback. So uh, that could be um, a visual feedback. So that means we, the patient can see where the um, robotic arm they're controlling is going, or it could be auditory, um, et cetera. But uh, these are kind of the main components of brain-computer interfacing. Um, so, uh, so the brain is a very complicated organ. I would argue it could be one of the most complicated organ. And there's still so much that we don't understand. And you can kind of approach um, the understanding of that with um, the example of if you're an alien um, and you don't know anything about the earth and you want to figure out something about the earth and you want to understand the human race. Uh, but there's, there's many different ways you can go about it. There's kind of a hierarchy of information, right? So you can, you can look directly at the earth. You could um, look at a subcontinent, for example, you know, the the North American continent. Uh, you can look at a country, for example, the US, a state, a county, neighborhood, and like a group of people, like for example, CMU undergraduate students. Um, and that's kind of the scale of information that the brain has. Uh, if you think about it, the brain has billions of neurons uh, that are interconnected, kind of like uh, the number of people on earth, right? Um, and the brain is divided into lobes and each lobe has uh, different functions and the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain um, are somewhat mirrored, but they also have um, individualized function. Um, and each side of your body is controlled um, by different sides of the brain. Um, within the brain, you have columns, uh, layers of neurons, um, and these neurons are cells, essentially brain cells that carry information and they communicate through dendrites and synapses, which are a combination of electrical and, uh, and uh, chemical signaling. Um, so uh, there's all those types of information. Um, how do we actually decode or understand what the brain is thinking? So um, the methods are mainly um, 
categorized into non-invasive and invasive uh, recording devices. So in the non-invasive side, so that means we're not putting anything inside the body. Um, you can use electrical or magnetic um, uh, recordings to kind of look kind of from if you're an alien looking at just the whole earth um, and then with, there's a lot of invasive devices where that involve implanting an electrode either on the surface of your brain or inside the brain deep inside the brain uh, where you can look at more like a count a country a city you know or a group of students and these devices, um, other than the fact that they range in invasiveness, they also range in the resolution, which is um, how close, uh, what's the level of information they can get, as well as the, what's called a temporal resolution, uh, which means uh, how long information uh, you can get. So in our lab, we use a non-invasive technique called the EEG, which is this messy, complicated looking thing that people wear on their heads. Uh, so it's really just a lot of electrodes and gels. So in here, that's 126 channels. And we asked the participants to imagine moving their left or right hand um, to control the movements. So uh, what we have figured out is, uh, if you see on this image here, uh, if you imagine you moving your left hand versus imagine moving your right hand, the, the um, brain activities, the electric activities across your brain has a very distinct shape, as you can see in the color as well um, uh, shown here and the, look, the side of the um, brain that, it, that shows the activity. Um, so uh, when we, after we decode that, we translate that into a robotic arm movement. And this is kind of something that's similar to your average video game, right? So if we ask the participant to think about using your right hand, the robotic arm moves right, left. Um, and then if they're at rest, the, the arm moves downwards. And if you're thinking about both hands, uh, then it goes upwards. So it's, it's definitely a little bit of a learning curve. And I think you high school students that kind of grew up a little more on video games than I did probably will uh, do it much better than I can. Um, and there are many different devices. So these directions that we can encode is just one type of information. Um, so, so you can think, if I can control direction, I can definitely control you know, an arm or where the arm goes, perhaps a self-driving car. And really the sky's the limit because you know, we, well, actually it's not the limit because we can control drones as well and you can take it to the sky, right? Um, and, and I, I mentioned in the beginning there are different ways that we can feed back the information to the brain. And these are really um, the direct senses of the human brain. So uh, a lot of it right now, it's in touch, eyesight, as well as hearing. But um, there have been uh, some devices that people are, are making to help people who can't smell, smell or taste, right? So um, that's one type of information because these are the information that are very um, intuitive to your brain. Um, but furthermore, we can also encode electrical information. Remember, the brain uh, speaks in electrical and chemical signals. So uh, we can encode these through what's called neuromodulation, which uh, we use electrical or magnetic signals to um, kind of put in information into the brain in a way. Um, and neuromodulation isn't just for feedback. It's also a way to treat diseases. Um, for example, a lot of neurological diseases um, occur because there is a disruption in the, net, the communication network within the electrical signals. So um, what we have been uh, able to do as a field, we have developed devices such as deep brain stimulation that can suppress Parkinson's tremors. So we can um, assist in hearing, um, alleviate pain. Um, in, in, a, in many different devices. And um, on the market now, I think these are devices that are uh, coming out probably within our lifetimes. Um, a lot of devices that can help with, for example, epilepsy, um, Alzheimer's, um, depression, tinnitus, and things like that. So we all know, we probably all know someone with a suffering from a neurological disorder and neuromodulation is another way that we can interface with the brain and help treat these diseases. And I'll be happy to take questions on that later on. Thank you. Okay, ready comrade? I am. 
So let me go ahead and give you a quick overview of how we do biomedical engineering here at Carnegie Mellon. So um, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, we do it. Uh, one thing that is, I think that we've got an idea of talking with uh, Erica and Rachel a little bit is that there's a lot of different applications of biomedical engineering. So we have stuff with lungs, we have stuff with uh, pharmaceuticals, we have things working with the brain and all those involve different engineering principles. So the way we do it at Carnegie Mellon is a little bit different than other schools. We do it as an additional or as a double major, meaning you do that in addition to either uh, chemical engineering, civil and environmental engineering, mechanical engineering, material science and engineering, and electrical and computer engineering. And each of those different fields brings a different skill sets um, that can be used then to solve different biomedical engineering problems. Uh, one thing with here then, um, we have a set of core classes and we have a set of track classes with that. Um, if you're really interested in the detail, I can answer questions on that. It is on our website, but the track classes actually give you different focus areas. So for an example, it will be biomedical signal and image processing. Um, these are students who are interested, for instance, in uh, developing pacemakers because you're analyzing electrocardiogram signals or uh, looking at MRIs that we'll talk about in a little bit or x-rays to develop better ways to do implants or something. Biomaterials and tissue engineering, that's what Erica was talking about. The ideas of perhaps growing your own organ using 3D printers, but also developing any kind of material that interfaces with the biological environment. So anything that's put on a orthopedic implant or an artificial heart valve, for instance, and interfaces with blood, uh, with the skin, anything that's biologic. Biomechanics, for instance, you're interested in how, ortho how an orthopedic knee is developed so it can actually help a ballet dancer who's torn up their ACLs or doesn't have any cartilage left in their knee, things like that. And perhaps how um, patients can better um, stretch in order to prevent uh, those ACL injuries that happen from the first place. We have cellular and molecular biotechnology. These are the folks who can basically, for instance, um, Dr. Koch talked about COVID-19 earlier to develop the uh, drugs to help treat COVID-19. Rachel talked about neuroengineering, the application of electrical and computer engineering principles, for instance, to develop uh, solutions that have to do with the nervous system. We also train students to do medical device development. So all, all, all of these companies um, that have to build all these devices need students who are biomedical engineers. So for instance, here in Pittsburgh, uh, Bayer uh, Medrad, uh, Philips Respironics, Smith & Nephew are example of three local companies that use biomedical engineers and we can train patients, sorry, train students to take jobs in those areas. Outside of per Pittsburgh, you think of Medtronic, you think of Abbott and many other smaller startups as well too. And we also have a self-design track. So let's say for instance, none of those areas interested you, we can work with you to find an area that doesn't interest you. So for instance, we had a student last year do a track in machine learning and how machine learning is used to uh, in biomedical engineering to actually 3D print materials. Honestly, one, one of the more exciting things I do as part of my job is to teach the capstone class. So literally, we have students who are collaborating on projects from concept to prototype. And these are interdisciplinary team. And that's one thing I think that's important. Just because we're talking about biomedical engineers here, you're also working with mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. You're working with clinicians who come up with the idea. And you're also working with industrial designers. These are students who um, are from the College of Fine Arts, the School of Design, who work to design um, devices, environments, things like that, and are working with our engineers. So one example is this photo right here. So this actually came from an idea from my student whose mother had Parkinson's disease and was unable to sit up and to go out to dinner. So their project was develop this brace right here that mom could wear when she uh, went out to eat to allow her to sit up properly. And we have a mechanical engineer, a mechanical and biomed, industrial design major, industrial design major, chemical and biomed, and material science and biomed. And the interesting thing with this project in particular, this actually became a company. 
um, after that some of these students worked on following graduation. A little different project um, with a bunch of engineers and industrial designers. Many of you have seen an inhaler. An inhaler typically works by pressing down from the top. This inhaler actually works from the side. So imagine if you were you had arthritis, if you're an older patient and can't make this motion by squeezing from the side or even using two hands, you are then able to use your inhaler and then get the medicine that you need. Um, this final one is a little bit different. So a tracheostomy is for with patients who have lost for whatever um, reason, perhaps disease, cancer, an accident, the uh, inability to breathe through their windpipe. So what patients do there, they, they have a hole cut into the, trach trache into the trachea and they insert a device like this. Now, the one drawback of doing that is that a lot of time you get a lot of mucus buildup and then you can't breathe through this uh, tube. So what this design team did, they designed a filter, a humidifier, and with this device actually to prevent that mucus buildup from happening in order to have patients be able to breathe easier. They also put in a speech plug because you do need air to go through your vocal cords in order to speak. By putting this plug in, they can essentially cover this plug and then the air goes back through the patient's vocal cords, which would be above, allowing them to speak. So very quickly, where do BME graduates do? 45% of them roughly go into industry, uh, medical device, pharmaceuticals, government working for the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, which approves all of these devices and drugs. 45% go to graduate school, um, not just Carnegie Mellon, but MIT, Cornell, Stanford, and other wonderful schools. And then actually we do send some folks to medical school. So a lot of our engineers don't wanna do the traditional biology or other life science majors to go to med school. They go through an engineering uh, background to go to medical school there. And I do think that um, clinicians who are trained as engineers do make better physicians than perhaps non-engineers because they have a different mindset of problem solving than perhaps a non-engineer would have. And that is all I have. So at this point, I'd like to uh, pass it off to Chelsea. Thanks, Conrad. Um, so I'm going to just chat for a little bit, uh, and then I'm going to show some slides about Bayer. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about how I use different experiences in my education to get into medical devices and what you do as a bioengineer at Bayer. Uh, so like I said, I started off at Carnegie Mellon. I did a double major in chemical engineering and bioengineering. Um, I knew I wanted to do bioengineering um, and I really liked chemistry and that seemed like a good enough reason to pick chemical engineering as my double major and I'm really happy that I did it. Um, and in the summers, I would intern where I could. So uh, I interned at a few different labs. So I started at some labs at CMU in chemical engineering and I also did some internships in labs and uh, bioengineering using stem cells. Um, I also, I wanted to see what it was like in industry. I knew I wanted to go into industry at some point. It's just um, always been something I wanted to do. So I interned at what used to be called Bayer Material Science. Now it's Covestro out by the airport. You see that big sign uh, that says Covestro and the big sign that says Bayer. Um, I was out there for two summers and I worked in the product safety and regulatory affairs division. Um, and I was also really interested in medical devices. So I took the classes that Dr. Zapanta talked about, um, that talked about medical device development. Um, and so I recommend that if you're interested, if you go into bioengineering, it's a super broad field. So take as many different classes as you can, do as many different internships as you can, because you, at least for me, I didn't know what I liked and what I didn't like until I tried it. So after I got my degree at Carnegie Mellon, um, I refined my bioengineering skills in graduate school. Um, and like I said, I went into orthopedic biomechanics for my PhD research. Um, and rather than talking about my research, just because that's not what I do anymore, um, I'll talk about some lessons that I learned. Um, so my engineering classwork, and this can be regardless of if you go into bioengineering or a different engineering field, that taught me how to think critically about tough problems. Um, and you start learning this from your first semester. So, you know, I had a tough time my first semester. That math was not easy to me, um, but you have to think critically about the problems and you have to work really hard. Um, I think a, an attribute that isn't really talked a lot about with engineering is you also have to be creative with your problem solving. A lot of folks think that if you're an engineer, you just are by the book, um, but you have to 
be creative in how you solve these tough problems. And throughout engineering classwork, the problems continue, but they just get tougher. So it just, uh, you have to think more and more critically. Um, and that gets into my next point about how you learn how important collaboration and group projects are. Um, so I'm sure that in school, you guys do a lot of different group projects. Um, and that's very important. Um, I'll tell you that those skills that you learn in high school, you'll learn them in college or you'll refine them in college when you do more group projects. And I still use them now in industry. Um, I work with different people. It's like a big high stakes group project uh, making medical devices. Um, and you learn the importance of clear communication. So you wanna make sure that you know, you know how to communicate what you're feeling, what you're thinking, and you know that other folks are understanding what you're thinking and what you're feeling. So those are my lessons that I learned. And now I'm going to share some slides to talk a little bit about FAIR because it's a little bit easier. Um, but where did that window go? Well, we'll just do this and we'll see what happens. All right. Oh, how do I get this to go away? Okay. So a little bit about Bayer. Bayer is a really big company. Um, and there are three main parts of Bayer. There's pharmaceuticals, there's consumer health, and there's crop science. Um, pharmaceuticals is where I work. Um, you probably know of Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Um, you see the, the ads on TV for the different drugs that uh, Bayer makes for pharmaceuticals. There's a focus on women's health care, um, cardiovascular diseases, and oncology. And my specific part of uh, Bayer Pharmaceuticals is this part below, Contrast Enhanced Diagnostic Imaging, uh, which I'll go into in a bit. We also have a Consumer Health Division. Um, this Consumer Health Division, you've probably heard of uh, Bayer Aspirin. That's what we're best known for, but there's also Dr. Scholl's, um, lots of dietary supplements, um, sunscreen, a lot of good stuff. And then crop science. So Bayer me recently merged with Monsanto. Uh, Bayer had a crop science division before, but now it's even bigger since the merger with Monsanto. Um, so we focus on things like seeds, crop protection, digital farming, and environmental solutions. So just to give a little bit of a flavor of how big Bayer is in the United States, there's over 300 sites in the United States. And those with um, more than 100 employees are shown on this map, but there are also sites all around the world. So it's a super big company. Um, but my part of Bayer is um, the radiology division, and it used to be a separate company called MedRad, so it's kind of like a smaller company within a big company, so it has the benefits of, of both sides. So now I'll talk a little bit about what we do here in radiology. So like I said before, um, we make injection systems for different imaging modalities, and you can think of these injection systems as like a super high-powered injection, as a super high-powered squirt gun. Um, so you can see that these all have syringes, except for this Intigo, but um, this is the product I work on, the Stellan. And so we load fluid into these two syringes. Um, you can kind of see them here. There's plungers with pistons that pull it down, just like your super soaker. And then to release it, the plunger and the piston go up, and the fluid go through the disposables or the tubing. So it would be the syringes and the tubing. And that tubing then connects to the patient's arm, and it delivers uh, the contrast for CT, MR, um, so CT is a CAT scan. A CAT scan is basically a stack of x-rays, so you can see um, 3D views of bones. MR is magnetic resonance imaging, um, so that uses magnets. Um, IR is interventional radiology or interventional cardiology. That's often used for cardiac studies or cardiac interventions. And then this is in the way, but this is a PET scan, so positron emission tomography. Um, this product called the Intego injects a radioactive fluid into people's veins. Um, and I don't work on this product, so I'm gonna say this in a very simplistic way because it's how I understand it. But it injects basically a radioactive sugar and then cancer cells eat that radioactive sugar and the, that eating um, shows up on um, scans. So somebody can say, this is where cancer is or there is no cancer here. So in addition to the devices and disposables, we also have a really large software division. Um, where we look at uh, personalizing protocols, et cetera. But here's the importance, and I think this, is, this slide is why a lot of us get into bioengineering and why you may be interested in biomedical engineering, um, especially with medical devices, 
is the devices that Bayer Radiology makes allows us and allows doctors to see things that aren't normally visible. So on the left here with the CT, um, you're able to visualize um, part of the heart that is not able to be visualized without contrast. And that can help us see if there are heart abnormalities or if a heart intervention is needed. And MR, this is an image of the brain and uh, the patient was injected MR contrast using our injector. And the doctor is able to see a brain lesion that they weren't able to see otherwise. Over here in the interventional radiology, we're able to visualize the tiny cell, the tiny um, blood vessels in the heart. Um, so you're able to see if there is um, some thickening of the line or if something is blocked. And then in the, in the PET or the positron emission tomography, uh, this arrow here is pointing to a cluster of uh, cancerous cells. Um, but again, this diagnosis is impossible without the contrast in the uh, devices that we make. So Everyone at Bayer is really proud of the um, ways that we can help patients and we can change medicine. And that is all the slides I have. Uh, thank you very much. And Thanks I think lot, now Chelsea. we'll be doing a QA. and a Yeah, yeah, we're moving to Q&A now. Um, and we, are, we have about 10 minutes to answer your questions. So I wanted to start with this question. Uh, you guys can turn on your, your cameras and microphones. Uh, so this first question I'm going to ask to Dr. Zapanta, what classes other than calculus, physics, and biology would be helpful for someone interested in studying biomedical engineering? So the one you left out was chemistry. That would be good, I think. And then also, um, don't knock the classes that, have, um, that help you read, um, to be able to read literature and understand them and also help you with, with your communication skills. So for those of you who are wondering, I wanna be an engineer, why am I taking this English class? The answer is because you have to be able to communicate with your teammates, uh, with other uh, people who are perhaps clinicians or people in manufacturing, et cetera. So um, all your classes are important. <laughs> That's I think I wanna emphasize, including those that, you, that aren't related to math and science. Great advice. Um, so there's been a couple questions here, and I and I'll guess I'll open this up to everyone, but, but maybe uh, ask uh, Chelsea to speak first. Um, there are questions about how difficult it is to find a stable job as a biomedical engineer, um, as well as as well as uh, keeping that job as a biomedical engineer, because I think there may be some misconceptions that it's it's very niche. Sure, that's a good question. Um... So I'll do the easy part first. Once you get a job, I think it's very easy to keep a job. Um, you just work hard and you um, just make sure that you're flexible to try new things. Um, that's something that I know is, it's not unique to bioengineering, but something in the bioengineering field is it's always changing. So you just have to be ready to accept those changes um, and be comfortable with it. And then I think you're all right. In terms of finding a job, um, I think that it's unique in, um, Carnegie Mellon that you have to double major. And I definitely think that helped me to find a job because folks knew that I had pretty, very strong chemical engineering background. Um, like I talked about with my medical devices field, we use a lot of fluid mechanics. So it was very helpful to be able to lean on that chemical engineering background uh, to help me land a job. But also I think the, the field is changing so much um, that we are very comfortable hiring bioengineers. So I'm also a manager at Bayer um, and I really am excited to bring bioengineers into, um, into Bayer because I know that a lot of stuff is trainable. Um, and I know that bioengineers have a base knowledge of engineering concepts and engineering disciplines that we can build on um, within Bayer. Okay, so um, I guess I'll, I'll ask this of, of Rachel and Erica. What inspired both of you to become a biomedical engineer? Oh, um, so for me, I actually wanted to go into medical school um, when I was starting college. Uh, and then kind of towards the end, after I finished all of my biology classes and engineering classes, I realized um, for me, designing solutions 
um, was more impactful. Um, designing medical devices, uh, you could touch more people. And honestly, I think it's a little more fun because you get to play around with things that you get to experiment, you get to um, talk to customers, um, kind of find um, needs in the field and uh, address them in very creative ways, typically. My answer is almost identical. Um, I was like about to take the MCAT and I was like, I would be really unhappy if I never got to actually make a device. I don't really want to be the person like following a given protocol, memorizing what to do and then using a device that exists. I was like, I want to be the person who's like, that's not working well. I don't want to have to use this piece of equipment that isn't great. I want to make it better. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Um, so this is an interesting question from, from Isaac. Um, so how do you measure success in biomedical engineering? And the example it's given is, you know, if a lawyer wins a case in the courtroom, then that's, that's a clear measure of success. But how is success measured in biomedical engineering, considering that, that some engineers may never solve a major problem in their career? And anyone can jump in and answer that. I, I can personally speak to it. think of it. Um, sorry, I personally think of it in terms of money and patient outcomes. So if you're part of a team that the summation of all your efforts improves a patient outcome, then you've changed someone's life. Or if you save money. Yeah, building off of what Erica said, um, to me, success is when I do a site visit and I see that a patient had a, a successful injection with our medical device or with the device that I'm the chief engineer of, I, that, that is success to me. And those are examples in industry. And for if you go on to be a professor, for example, you know, teaching students, um, having your students go on to become engineers and making impacts, um, as well as publishing in the field, um, making, you know, trying to find the forefront of um, a research area is also a measure of success. Yeah, I think that's a great answer too, because we're all building upon this body of knowledge. And even if you're not the one who solves it, you may have a study that leads another person to learn something new, that leads another person to le learn something new, that ultimately does result in that, that major breakthrough that, that saves lives. If I could jump in there really quickly, Dr. Cook, I think one thing, looking at some of the questions as well, um, we don't have all the answers. I think that's one thing that's important. We lean on other people, clinicians, uh, other people who may be better at programming than us, other people are better at manufacturing, other people are processing signals. Uh, we don't need to be good at everything that involves biomedical engineering. We need to know how to be, there's certain core things we need to know to understand how the body works. Can we solve problems? Uh, can we think of solutions? But when we come together, we work as a team and collectively we all have the knowledge and perhaps not individually, we're not required to have it all up here. So we have time for one last question and I want to apologize for everyone's questions that we didn't get to. Um, so uh, we'll do our best to, to follow up with everyone um, regarding these questions. Um, but I wanted to ask one last one. So what can high school students do now to become involved in biomedical engineering? Anyone can take that one. I think really quickly, you know, looking at it from um, perhaps if you want to go to college and learn more about it, talking to professors at various schools. So the benefit of Western Pennsylvania, there are a lot of schools with biomedical engineering programs. Um, here at Carnegie Mellon, obviously we have one University of Pittsburgh, uh, Penn State main campus as well. And many other um, of those types of schools have those uh, programs. So email, email a professor, honestly, is a one good way. So get on the website, um, say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm interested in your research. What can you tell me? And we'll, we'll answer those emails. I think also a lot of high schools have clubs that you could join. Um, so you might be able to look at some extracurriculars. 
Um, but to echo what Dr. Zapanta said, if you if you know of if your parents have a friend who's involved or your neighbor has a friend, don't ever feel shy or embarrassed to reach out because I can't tell you how excited I am to be able to talk to you guys. And I know that so many of my colleagues would be honored to be able to share our enthusiasm and answer your questions. So don't just feel free to reach out, be brave, because um, we're really happy to talk to you. Okay, I think that's going to do it for us for today. I want to thank all of the panelists. I really appreciate you all being here, being willing to share your expertise. And I want to thank all the attendees. It's exciting to us to have this many people come and learn about biomedical engineering. And we really do hope to see you as fellow colleagues in this field in the future. Thanks a lot, everyone.